prison itself is a mental health producing system. A matter of fact, solitary confinement itself, where most of the people with mental health end up at, is actually causes antisocial personality disorder, it causes disease. You're gonna have arthritis. You may have type two diabetes just from being in that compressed environment. Um, people leave out of there with all kinds of triggers and traumas, and I'll never be the same. My name is Five Mualam Ak. I live with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and I uh, was incarcerated across city jails, county facilities, upstate for about nine to 12 years. You know, living with mental health while incarcerated, um, there is no living, it's surviving. I don't think that there's a functional space for people with mental health inside of correctional systems, period. Whether it's jail, prison, um, however the uh, sort of confinement is, um, it's all triggering, it's all hard to survive. Prisons ev can adversely impact those with mental health disorders from the very ideology in that our current prison systems were not built to serve people that do have mental health issues. What happened is the unintended consequences of policies that were enacted in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The unintended consequences were what happens if you close the asylums, if you deinstitutionalize mental health treatment facilities, what are you going to do with these, this population? And unfortunately, a lot of this population is actually being treated within the jail and prison system. This is a place where you have to be on your toes. You have to hear every word a person says. Uh, the way the disciplinary system is set up is that, you know, there's a ticketing system, there's different tiers. Every ticket could be a tier one or a tier two or a tier three level of punishment. And they're mostly for things that are uh, sort of normal for human people to have normal human actions. So in prison, like there's no talking. So for a person that has exponential energy and talks a lot, it becomes this sort of process where you are constantly being in trouble or looked at as problematic. Um, it's like, you know, you see this guy, he's walking around the solitary, you're like, why is this guy in the box? Well, he was running around the tier, banging his head on the wall, yelling at people. I was like, well, why was he in prison? Well, he was walking around the streets, banging his head on the wall, yelling at people. And so the conditions that land you in prison often are the conditions that hold you there and the majority of people end up in solitary confinement. The modalities that are utilized in prison can be problematic. For example, the concept of, of isolation, solitary confinement. A person that's suffering from a disorder such as schizophrenia that's psychotic, uh, isolating them can make things a lot worse. A person that's suffering from a bipolar disorder in a manic phase, isolating them can make things worse. But we have to find that, that healthy medium about how to actually adequately support and not actually exacerbate their, their illness. I think that one of the reasons why I went to the box uh, was because of uh, sort of pushing the levels of those interactions. It was a negative exchange between me and another officer who um, wanted a portrait done. I do portraits in prison. That's sort of how I use my focus to escape that um, led to uh, my charges, which were unauthorized exchange, um, possession of stolen property, uh, destruction of state property, hoarding, um, and multiple weapons. And uh, that sounds pretty bad until you realize that the unauthorized exchange was the guy next door. It's like, you know, my wife sends me these black enterprise magazines. I'm a white guy from Buffalo. Do you want these? Um, and it had his name on it. So if I said that he gave them to me, he would go to the box too, which would create a, another situation being that he's a person of a different race. And hoarding was that I had two stamps over the limit. Um, also I had two pillows, which I had a permit for, and I had an art permit for my utensils, but they ripped that off the walls and they come in. And um, the destruction of state property was because we rip up sheets to basically make a line to fish. And so uh, those were some of the preliminary charges, but what really hurt me, uh, I think, was the 12 sharpened wooden objects, which is how they wrote up pencils. And so uh, you go to solitary for nonviolent reasons in some sense. When I was in Auburn, I was just barely holding on. And it was because 
I had filled my day. You only get two mods a day. So you can go to program or you can go to work and that's it. I had four mods. So I was the volunteer porter on a tier. I taught kosher. I was the kosher uh, inspector for the kitchen with the rabbi. I taught religious services two times a week. I worked in the school building three times a week. Uh, I also went to Cornell University as a student. And then I also uh, was the block porter. And so it kept me in manic mode all the time. Uh, in bipolar disorder, you have these deep drops of depression. In, in prison, you can't do that. You'll die or you'll find yourself in a hole that you can't get out of. And so for that, you keep yourself perpetually up. So caffeine and carbs is a regular diet, but keeping that adrenaline in my system also pumped in cortisol as I learned later on. So that's why I have arthritis and so many medical problems. And that busyness got cut and shipped to solitary where you have this sort of bundle of energy stuck inside of a six by nine solid wall cell uh, with no air, no vacuum, this 200 light that feels like the sun that never sets above you to the point that you sit there, you, you know, people always ask me, what are you doing in solitary? It's like, what do you do past counting the bricks, all the cracks in the walls? Uh, but for a person with schizophrenia, sort of bipolar disorder, you, it's like having these hyper senses. Um, it's not just the fact that I can feel the weight of the air. It's the wind that's blowing under the door, like stupid talking to you. It's uh, the dripping of the toilet that just slowly builds on you. Um, it's like a drop of water. If you singly drop it on your head and if you focus on something else, it wouldn't bother you. But without any distractions and only these other voices in my head, you tend to make rash decisions by yourself. My physical condition uh, always impacts the medical the mental and always vice versa. So I'm diabetic and often in certain facilities, they take you out to medical to get insulin, but in solitary, they come to your cell. And so I'm getting insulin in a slot, the needle breaks, little blood sprays. I'm, I'm asked out of insulin. And so I have about eight hours until I see the next human being. But if I miss that, it's gonna be nine, 10, 11, 12 hours and I'll be dead by then. Um, so I have, basically the next 5 a.m. breakfast shift to get what I need. And so I'm pacing back and forth, I'm talking to myself, and early in the morning, in this sort of vacuum of a space, it becomes this sort of microphone for the rest of the facility. I know people don't understand it, but you can hear things more acutely in your cell from outside. So I hear the keys, two floor down, I hear him loading the trays, I hear the conversation, the mumbers, and I'm panicking, like I have to get this guy's attention. So the elevator's coming up, boom, the cart's in the room, I hear the slots open and bang. I'm thinking like, how can I get this guy to get me to medical? How can I get the attention that I need? Bang, the carts are coming, the slot is open, it's getting fast. I'm thinking like, how can I, well, if I cut my hand and I reach for the tray, then he'll see that I'm bleeding, he's gonna give me medical attention. Um, and so I do that, it works. I get to medical. Um, and so when you hear people, you know, harming themselves or hurting themselves inside of solitary, it is sort of the dramatic way to get the resources and what you need that may be life-saving. You know, inside of prisons, uh, there is no mental health assessment. And without assessment, there's no treatment. And without that connection to your prior treatments or the outside, you're left in this limbo of, so you have problems, you say, mm -hmm. you're seeing things, oh, oh you're hallucinating, oh, okay. Um, they don't really validate your problems, it's just considered as being problematic. So with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, they gave me lithium, which of course was a bad medication, gave me a rash, you react to that rash, it's like, hey, I don't wanna take this because it's causing me physical harm. They're saying, well, you obviously don't have a mental harm if you don't wanna take this medication. So it becomes this sort of state where people inside end up having to prove that they have a problem just to be uh, sort of treated for that problem. And the treatment is minimal and it's only medication that they prescribe or the generic version of that, you're getting the less version. Uh, so things like talk therapy, things like um, psycho, you know, emotional support, um, talking to a psych who can actually diagnose what you're 
sort of delusions are to break them down also ground your reality i think that the strongest point is family so that exclusion from my kids from people who understand me from people who know what you're going through um that type of support is is is, is a void in prison and so you end up decompensating by yourself you end up having this sort of personality shift by yourself and this is on top of the many many mood disorders and mental conditions that prisons and jails cause on a normal basis um, for me it was hard to thrive without those supports um, so i just kept spiraling down 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 to the point that i'm looking like dr jonathan kimball like the fugitive in a cell talking to myself writing on the walls and drawing because it was like my only outlet. And even that, all of that is punishable. One of the many things that I think needs to happen in the system uh, to help people with mental health is they shouldn't be there in the first place. When you look at a person's diagnosis and their conditions, and if their crime associates with their conditions, they shouldn't be incarcerated in the first place. I think that besides adequate mental health care, there's not enough of treatment that goes on in facilities. It is just, what do you need so you'll stop complaining being here? Um, there is no psychiatrist. There's sometimes one per hub, which means one uh, psychotherapist or one trained psychiatrist um, or doctor between four or five facilities. Um, and that's not conducive to having a regular treatment to support you. As a community, as a society, we need to understand that these lives matter. The best way to rehabilitate is to have a systems of care perspective, understanding that it's the entire environment that really needs to help. We talk about psychiatrists, social workers, uh, parole officers, and uh, just the, the entire community at large. People in prison, people in jail, the vast majority are going to be released. So do you want to have a situation in which people are worse off when they come out as compared to when they came in. This is why we have to invest in this, because if you don't take care of this, this is going to impact you. If you have a person that's been in prison for 20, 10, 20, 20 years, and they don't have the skills to function outside of prison and the temptation to engage in behavior that led to them in the prison in the first point. Is that the society that we want? Fundamentally, we all have the power to dictate the environment that we want to have. And are we, as a society, are we able to have empathy for our neighbor? Are we able to give a hand out to a person that's struggling and help that person reach the zenith of their potential. So that's a question that as a society that we have to answer. Prison itself is a mental health producing system. A matter of fact, solitary confinement itself where most of the people with mental health end up at is actually causes antisocial personality disorder. It causes disease. You're gonna have arthritis. You may have type two diabetes just from being in that compressed environment. Um, people leave out of there with all kinds of triggers and traumas and I'll never be the same. You know, they say, you know, oh, you're a solitary survivor, but nobody survives. Uh, it's really asking you how damaged are you or how much damage have you received? Uh, when I came home, it was impossible for me to exist. I don't do much. I don't have a social life. All I do is work. Um, I've been exasperated because my mind has adapted to this condition. Um, so some of my days are two days straight, mostly two, three days a week. Um, I don't sleep like a normal person and I live in a constant state of pain and suffering. That is normal and it won't change unless we change it. And we have the power to change and stop all of that.